Hello. My name is Father Chris Thomas. I'm the General Secretary of the Bishops' Conference of England and Wales, and I'm here with Father Jan Novotnik, uh, who works with me here at the Bishops' Conference. He is our Director of Mission, looking after the areas of dialogue, unity, and of evangelization and discipleship. We're having a conversation today because the Holy Father, our Holy Father Pope Francis, has called for a synod in 2023. And this has been a very popular uh, piece of news recently, not only within the Catholic Church, but outside of it. And we're going to have a conversation about what this truly means. So, Father Jan, what is different about this synod that the Holy Father has called compared with the other synods that have taken place over the years? I think um, the first thing to say is that this synod is different because it's actually the beginning of something new that the Holy Father is offering to the church a process whereby he wishes to engage in a dialogue not just with the bishops because when we talk about a synod um, we're really talking about the synod of bishops which was instituted which began just after the second vatican council pope paul the sixth um, invited the bishops of the world to continue the dialogue the conversation that had began at the second vatican council and every two or three years from about the mid-1960s, bishops from across the world have gathered in Rome to talk about issues that are pertinent to the faith. Um, and this has continued to this very day. Pope Francis has sort of extended that a little bit by saying, yes, it's good that the bishop, who is the focal point of unity in a diocese um, and knows what's going on in his diocese, is able to be involved in that conversation but what Pope Francis says is that synodality, a key word which we're going to talk a bit more about, um, means that the whole people of God, not just the clergy, but everyone, clergy and laity together, um, are involved in the mission and the life of the church. So what's new about this synod is that this is for everyone. Hmm. And the, you use the word synodality. It's a word that we've heard a lot about over the last few weeks. What does synodality mean? Gosh, well, there's a question. Synodality basically um, comes from the Greek. Um, why wouldn't we go back to our roots? But um, two words really, synhodos, which means walking or journeying together. And so synod is right in the root of what we have done as Christians throughout the centuries. You could say that the first synod began um, with the Council of Jerusalem, which is recounted um, in Acts 15. Um, when there was um, things to sort out, the, thinking about whether the new converts um, to Christianity, those who hadn't been Jews, um, coming from a Jewish background, those from the Greek background, the Hellenistic background, whether they should be circumcised before they became Christians. Um, and this was at the root of a discussion in Acts 15. And the disciples got together to talk about this. The decision was made um, that this wasn't ultimately necessary. Um, and then this decision was ratified by Peter, St. Peter, um, and St. James, the head of the local church in Jerusalem. And then this news was disseminated, sent by letter, um, to all the other Christian churches, to the other communities. So this kind of decision-making or consulting has been happening right from the very beginning um, of the early church, which is there in Acts. So it's interesting you should say that because uh, um, you know, the processes that we've been used to over the uh, last um, 50 years in terms of synods has always been that. There's been an issue to discuss, there's been a consultation, um, and a different consultation really from what we're having now, which is much broader than what's happened in the past. The bishops have gathered with Peter around them, um, they've discussed it, they've debated it, uh, and then um, there's this thing called normally the post-synodal apostolic exhortation, yeah. which is the letter, I assume, that comes back to the churches afterwards, and that's disseminated with the thoughts of the Holy Father after consulting uh, the bishops. Is that correct? That's completely correct, and, that, and that's the way that it has happened really since the 1960s. Paul VI, Pope Paul VI, um, instituted the Synod of Bishops in 1965, so immediately at the end of the council. Um, he said when he did that, you know, we've got this kind of process, um, it's not perfect and it may need to change. Now, it didn't change very much. Both Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict XVI used a very similar methodology. So they looked at issues which were pertinent to the church's life 
1985, for example, there was um, a discussion about the church as communion um, and what we understand about the communion of the church, really um, highlighting those themes which had come out at the Second Vatican Council. Now, Pope Francis came along and in his wonderful letter, Evangelii Gaudium, sets out a kind of a way that he believes God is asking the church to be um, in this new millennium. And he says the church has to continue to enter into a dialogue with humanity, so with all people, not just those who are Catholics, but other Christians, those of other faiths. So, for example, um, Pope Francis in 2018, we had a synod on young people. So we asked the bishops to, to find out what young people were thinking in the church. Um, and before that, um, the first synods really in Pope Francis's time um, were on the family. And again, there was a wider consultation throughout the whole church. And I think what Pope Francis was saying is that the pastors, the bishops of the church, have a duty and an obligation to hear what the faithful are saying. So it's not just a process of a bishop teaching, but in that process of teaching, the bishop hears what the people of God are saying. And I think Francis, Pope Francis, thought that this was a good thing to do. And so he's asking the church now really to think about um, how do we live our life of faith um, together? Priests, bishops, people, religious, the whole community of the church. What does it mean to be a member of God's family in our current context. So um, what's interesting is that uh, the title of the Synod is For a Synodal Church, Communion, Participation and Mission. Mm. Can we unpack that a little bit? Yeah, thank you for that because that is really important because I think some of what we're hearing um, in the media and sometimes in our Catholic understanding, we just hear that it's a synod on synodality. Why do we need a synod um, discussing how synods happen? Um, it's not that. It's about those three key words, communion, participation, and mission. And what I would say is that these are linked very much to the diocesan church. So we're not thinking here broadly um, about the universal church, about the Pope in Rome. We're thinking about what is this context for us in our own situation? So what we have is communion. We are all, through our baptism, members of the church, and we become members of the family of God. This mirrors the idea of communion in the Holy Trinity, a God who is three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The members of the church are baptized in the name of that Trinity, and we become the family of God. So the first step is communion. Um, the church is a communion of the faithful, the baptized members of the church, on a pilgrimage to where? Ultimately, to heaven. But in our communion, we are called to participate in the life of the church. How do we participate in the life of the church? I think, hopefully, we would think about our sacramental life, receiving the other sacraments of initiation, communion and confirmation, sustained in our life of prayer, in reading of the scriptures, in learning about our faith. So our communion, the fact that we're baptized, leads to participating and being a full member of the family of God. When we live our faith, it's not something that is just personal, just for me. It is something to be shared. This is the mission of the church. Jesus, um, his last words to the church before he ascended into heaven uh, were, you know, go and make disciples of all nations. So the church exists, and uh, I don't want to get too technical here, but in Lumen Gentium I, Lumen Gentium is a document of the Second Vatican Council discussing the life of the church. Right at the beginning, it talks about um, the church being a sacrament or a sign, an instrument of God's love in the world. So remembering that through our baptism, we are in communion with God and with each other. We participate um, as members of the family of God in the life of the church. But our mission is to proclaim God's name to other people, um, to all those whom we meet, um, drawing on the resources of the scripture, the sacraments, our own personal life of prayer. And I think this is what Pope Francis is saying is important in a synodal church. We have this great treasure, this great richness of faith, which has been given to us as a free gift from God. Now we're called to share that gift with others. 
and a synodal experience says that we probably have to listen to what each other are saying. So, you know, we may hear the voices of the world out there, um, people who are not particularly people of faith. They may have a difference of opinion, of understanding the context of the world in which we live. What Pope Francis is saying, if we all journey together, um, people with their priests and their bishops and with the Pope, with him, Pope Francis, then we listen to each other in that communion and we bring about a fresh understanding of how to present our faith to the world. Communion, um, participation, mission. Well, what's also interesting, which I think is quite a big novelty, uh, something that's, that's new about this process, is the Pope is saying to us, this is not just about us looking inwards, but we also have to engage with other people as well. So two particular groups that he's said that we should engage with are our ecumenical brothers and sisters from other churches and ecclesial communions, but also the interfaith world and people who have no faith. Now, how do we do that? This is a very interesting question, and I think Pope Francis, and I'd, I would almost use the word challenger, he challenges us and has done um, right from the very beginning of his pontificate. You know, I think we've all heard the phrase, go out to the peripheries. What does he really mean by that? He means to go out to those people who aren't the ones that normally have an association with the church. So firstly, that may even be members of our own families and friendship circles, those who are baptised Catholics who, for whatever reason, aren't practising their faith at the moment. So Pope Francis is aware that, you know, the church encompasses not just those who are faithfully trying to live out their faith, but an invitation to look to those who have moved away. And then, really interestingly, and this is a great novelty, the Pope has said we can learn, if we listen, to the experience um, of other Christians um, and other faiths, because they have something to share with us on the journey. An example of this would be um, the Greek Orthodox Archbishop, Archbishop Nikitas, um, who has a charge to look after the Greek Orthodox community here in England and Wales. Um, speaking to an ecumenical group recently, um, he was talking about why we do ecumenism, and he said, you know, Basically, we do it because we share a common humanity. We believe as Christians we're all the children, the people of God. Um, he even brought it down to a much lower um, thought pattern when he said, you know, when we switch on the tap, we all share the same water. We all drink the same water. Um, we all have to live in the same space. And I think that's what Pope Francis is saying as well. The church has to be open to everyone. We can't just think about ourselves. The Lord, in his own mission, is saying, go out and make disciples. We need to talk to each other. And one of the other things the Pope has said, which I think is very important, um, is that this is a spiritual process. This is a process that is rooted in prayer and it's rooted in the, in the liturgical life of the church. So, one, and what he means by that is that this is, this is not about going straight to issues but it's about um, discerning under the power of the Holy Spirit how we move forward. There's a lovely bit in his book, Let Us Dream, where he talks about overflow. Yeah. And uh, um, perhaps you'd, you could talk a little bit about that, because I think that's very key to the, uh, the way in which we should understand the process, rather than thinking simply about issues. Yeah, I think um, that's a really good point. I think um, when we first hear, and I was talking a bit earlier about synod on synodality, um, people immediately think, oh, is this going to allow us to think about there's going to be a lot of change in the church? Are you know, some of the things that we've held true for so long going to change overnight? No, is the simple answer to that. What this process is about, and the Pope uses the word very, very often, of discernment. And what are we discerning and who is helping us to discern? Well, I think it's clear what we're trying to discern. We're trying to discern what God is saying to the church at the moment and how we're called to be missionary disciples, how we're called to show our mission, the mission of the church through our love of God and our love of each other. But how do we discern to do that? Well, we could sit down and think about it, but that's not good enough. We have to sit down and pray about it. And all prayer begins, as we know, um, usually for, for us as Catholics, by making the sign of the cross. And we invoke the name of the Trinity. And the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, is really important here. 
because Jesus told us that God will give us, the Father will give us the gift of the Holy Spirit when we ask for it. So in our discernment, we pray asking the Holy Spirit in the light of the scriptures that we read, in the light of our own experience of life, to enlighten us so that we see with the eyes of God. It's almost like we're both wearing glasses, so, and I can't see very well without my glasses. When I've got my glasses on, it's almost a bit like asking, you know, the analogy I would use is, you know, our prayer helps us to put the glasses on to see through a prism, which is the prism that the Holy Spirit enlightens for us. You know, it's not just our own thoughts, but we're assisted through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, you asked me about overflow. Um, in the book, Let Us Dream, Pope Francis does actually dream. And what he talks about is that, you know, the church's tradition and all its wonderful teaching and all the things that we trust in are like a river flowing. And that river um, gives life um, to everything on the side of the river, the, the grass and the trees, the plants and the foliage. Um, but sometimes it just rests sort of on the concrete. It can't get into the cracks. And what Pope Francis says is, you know, these overflow moments happen when the river bursts its banks. And these happen actually when we put our glasses on, when we allow the Holy Spirit to teach us something new that we haven't thought about before, um, a bit like a synodal journey. And the water overflows and it flows over all the things that are beautiful, like the trees and the plants and the foliage, which are our scripture and our tradition. But then it gets into the cracks of the hard concrete. Sometimes our hearts are a bit hard and it allows us to be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what I think Pope Francis is saying to the church at the moment. Open your heart. So we need our divine spectacles in order, in order to work on this process. Now, what do you think the Holy Father wants to achieve? Is there a single point or is this just a change of being? Well, there is the question that everybody is asking at the moment. What does the Holy Father want to achieve by a synodal process? Well, if it's not big change and if it's not um, answering lots of questions, it's about a way of being. So what Pope Francis is saying to the church is, this is an opportunity for us, and let's go back to what we've been talking about, in our diocesan families, to think about what are the important things for us now, living the life of faith? What are some of the challenges? We don't have to look far to think about what COVID and the pandemic has given us as a big challenge. Um, it's, it's shown people's vulnerabilities, but it's also shown how people are really generous with each other, uh, the goodness of humanity, and I think into that, the mission of the church says that we can assist people with the things that are challenging. We can celebrate the good, not just in the way of saying, isn't that marvellous, but saying this is the work of Christ and his church. So it's not about big changes for the church, but it's about a change of heart, and it's about a way of change of living our Christian life. But firstly, in our families, in our parishes and in our diocese. And ultimately it begins with a prayerful listening and discerning what the Holy Spirit is saying to the church at the time, at this present time. And that really um, you know, is, 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 is the most important thing because one of the things I've always believed is that what happens in the local should be reflected in the universal and the universal reflected in the local. So this is not about the changings of the universal but it's about how we can be more effective missioners where we are so that the whole, the network, as it were, of the, of the local churches actually makes a difference to the universal. Absolutely. And again, this is, you know, this is a theme of Pope Francis's pontificate that, um, you know, he's the Pope. So he keeps all things in unity. He, he is the, the pontifex, the bridge builder. He's the one that is the, the focal point of unity for all the local churches, for all the dioceses, across the world. But he knows that, you know, um, a diocese here in England and Wales um, is different, has a different context to say a diocese in Africa or in Australia. Not because we have a different faith, not because we believe different things about the gospel, but because the context of our lives is different and we are having different challenges. And so what the Pope is saying is, you know, work with that but also share what you have received in your context 
with others to build up the body of Christ. And so I personally think what Pope Francis wants to achieve in this synodal process is to say, we as members of the church believe that we've received this precious gift from God. It's not to be kept unopened by ourselves and the church, but it's to be offered to others. And I think for me, um, that's what a synodal process is about, offering anew the gift of Jesus Christ to our world of today. Thanks, Father Jan. Thank you, Father Chris.